Hello, this is Minister Leonard Harris, and again, this is a pleasure to be before you to uh, discuss our Sunday School lesson for this Sunday, January the 29th, 2023. And this is uh, still out of our Faith, faith Pathway studies. This is Unit 2. God's Promises, and this is lesson number nine, and it's entitled Promises of Restoration and Gladness. Our devotional reading is from the book of Exodus. It is the 33rd chapter, verses 12 through 23. Our background scriptures are from the book of Job, the first chapter, verses 1 through 4, and then the second chapter, verses 18 through 31. And our printed passage is Job, the second chapter, verses 21 through 27. And our key verse is, and I'm reading from the NIV, it says, You will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be ashamed. That is Joel the second chapter of verse 27 and for this lesson our lessons aims are contrast the prophet's threats with god's promised restoration explore feelings that accompany words of threats and words of restoration. And then finally, offer a prayer of thanks for God's restoration. Our lesson has two parts to it. And the first section is entitled Rejoice. And that is Joel, the second chapter verses 21 through 23 and then our next the area of study in our lesson is entitled receive and that's joel the second chapter verses 24 through 27 and that concludes the two parts of our lesson for this Sunday. And as always, before we uh, begin to unwrap our Sunday School lesson, uh, we will go before God and ask for God's intervention into the study of our lesson. Heavenly Father, we thank you once and again for continuing to do what you've always done, for always going a step ahead of us and even being with us in the process, in the steps of this journey, doing our best to serve you completely and wholeheartedly. And Father, we just ask that as we indulge into the lesson today, that you would unfold unto us the things you would have us to know and to receive and then also to do. And we ask that all that we say will be done with your approval and your acceptance and be acceptable in your sight. And we ask it all in the name of Christ, and for his sake we ask it. Amen. Our lesson for today starts out uh, with 
the title Rejoice. And in the lesson, uh, one of the aims was to uh, show the contrast between the threats and then also to the promise. The threats from Joel and then the promises uh, from God. Now also, uh, we realize that the threats, the alerts, the alarms, the warnings that were spoken from the mouth of Joel were also uttered and ushered by God. And so when we look at the contrast between the two, we are not, uh, let's say, we're not actually dissecting and looking at one source compared to the other because the true source is the same. And so we look at verses 21 through 23, and it tells us, or it says uh, to the people of Judah, it says, Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn or former rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers both in the former and the early rains. Uh, other translations read both in the autumn and spring rains as before. So whether we are speaking of former or latter, the early or the autumn, the spring or the fall, these are confirmations that God is going to restore the people in the land of Judah after there has been desolation and devastation in the land. And the part in reference to restoring the land and then the prophet speaking and even declaring to the land that the God of creation has said to the land not to be fearful and not to be afraid, but rejoice and be glad because the Lord is doing and going to do great things and restore it. So we wanted to look at the emphasis on the former and the latter rain, the spring and the fall. And we want to look at a parallel here. Um, when speaking of the former and the latter rains, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the 11th chapter, uh, verses 14 through 17, it speaks again to the restoring of the former and the latter rain. Uh, it, it, it gives guidelines as to uh, what needed to be done in order to make certain that these things would be fulfilled and that they would become normal again. And of course, it was based upon the behavior, the conduct 
of the people in the book of Deuteronomy speaking to Israel again. But we want to focus on time here. The timing of that writing is about four, uh, 1450 uh, B.C. 1450 B.C. And then we see in our lesson for this Sunday, and this writing is around 800 B.C. in Joel, and uh, again, speaking about the conditioning or the bringing forth of the rain to the land to restore the fertile soil and the to restore the lively crops to the land. And so we're now going from 1450 B.C. And now God is saying again that uh, I'm going to restore the farmer and the latter rains. And this is in Joel uh, 800 B.C. And then if we go all the way to the book of James in the fifth chapter, uh, verses 7 through 12, uh, in the book of James, now our timing is 60 A.D. So we've gone from before Christ until in the time of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, 60 A.D. And again, in the seventh verse of the fifth chapter of James, we, ha we hear again the same phraseology, the farmer and the latter rains. And what we want to lift from this is that we have a pattern here. We have a pattern of God continuing his promise to his people based upon their conduct, their behavior, and their living. And he continues God doesn't change. He makes the same request to his people to uh, remove ourselves from this faulty living that we've adopted. And if you do so, I will do for you the same thing that I've already done for you without the devastation and the desolation. And so I wanted to lift that parallel just to show that once again, God is saying to his people that if you do what I ask, and I only ask what is best for you, but if you follow my wording, if you follow the utterance from the prophets I've sent to you, if you follow my text, if you follow what I have written unto you, then I will bless your land. And so I wanted us to see the timetable here that uh, this phraseology of former and latter rains has been repeated again and again and again. And I've only lifted three passages just to give us like a timetable reference of how God has moved and continues to move among his people. Now, we want to also look at uh, what were some of the proceedings? What were the, as we mentioned earlier, the alerts, the warnings, the alarms to prep us for what was about to take place? In our lesson, uh, in our background scriptures, and this is out of the first chapter of Joel and um, verses 1 through 4. And 
it reads uh, the word of the Lord that came to Joel the prophet. And in the second verse, it reads, Hear this, you elders, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust have eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. And look at the instruction here. At first it tells us the order by which this announcement should be made. And it says, call your elders and then give them ear, cause them to listen to what I want them to speak to the inhabitants of the land. There, here is a certain order that we have fallen away from, and that is listening to the elders. The elders have lived through the years that we are still practicing, the years that we are still journeying through. They have seen more than what we've seen. They've had more experiences. They've lived through different periods of time and they've been exposed to different things and therefore they've developed the understanding and the learning that is received going through different periods of time, different experiences, different consequences. And therefore they can provide the lessons learned. They can give us wisdom and instruction. So the word appears and it says, call the elders and tell them to speak this to the inhabitants of the land. And then it alerts the people by saying, have you ever seen anything like this before? Has this ever happened in your era? Have you ever experienced this? And then it tells them, when you pass through this, tell your children. And then tell your children to tell their children. And then tell those children to tell the next group of children. Pass this down from generation to generation. And what we uh, see here is there is a swarm of locusts that has come upon the land, the land of Judah. And uh, er, as a result of it, there was a devastation. The land was destroyed uh, when in the beginning of our lesson on the first part it talks about rejoicing it talks about how the land is going to be restored and so once we realize well the land is being restored or well, something must have happened that depleted the land which caused it to have to be restored and which caused God to have to speak to the people and tell them to rejoice and uh, not to be afraid. Don't be in fear anymore because I'm going to restore unto you the years that the locusts took. And so in looking at our lesson, uh, I 
realize that uh, this swarm of locusts, uh, not just a biblical occurrence, but this is a historical account uh, that even we in North America have experienced. There was a swarm of locusts in 1874 and 1875, and then again a swarm of locusts on July the 26th in 1931. And so uh, when we think about uh, these, uh, this uh, devastation that took place in the land of Judah, uh, back during the uh, biblical timetable. Uh, we can also uh, look online at what is a swarm of different various types of locusts and what is that like and how, how do we uh, make a connection or an understanding of what that type of desolation is it really a like? What is it? The the swarm that took place in um, uh, 1874, uh, they spoke of it as uh, it devastated the land area known as the heartland, uh, the Great Plains of the United States and Canada. And so some of the areas that it hit was Dakota and Montana and Wyoming and Colorado and Iowa and Minnesota and Missouri and Nebraska and the uh, uh, Native American territories and down even into Texas. And so it had swept down through uh, the middle section or central Midwest, uh, Midwestern area. Now, when the locusts hit, the area that uh, they said was devastated, uh, it wasn't uh, 200 uh, miles or it wasn't 2,000 miles. Uh, it wasn't uh, 200,000 miles, but 2 million square miles. And the locusts had devastated this heartland area. And even though other parts of the country were not hit, like the western coast or the eastern coast, even though they weren't hit with the swarm, they were still devastated because of the crops that were destroyed. And there is some... Uh, particulars about the swarm of the locusts that give us some lessons. One of the things about it is the climate that produces the devastation. The climate that produces the devastation. Uh, one type of the locusts are referred to as the desert locusts, and that is because uh, locusts or bread, they have uh, pods or they're referred to as egg pods, and they grow in dry conditions. In dry conditions, when the topsoil has been uh, drained of moisture and when the moisture is removed then the topsoil becomes vulnerable for the egg pods of locusts and they are produced they lie dormant you can't actually see them but they're underneath they're present but they're not visible to the eye and with the right elements, then they are birth. The egg pods actually produce the locusts. And the first locusts 
or crawling locusts. In verse 4 of Joel, uh, it talks about the different types of locusts. The first locusts are just crawling locusts. They feed upon the land. And so what we look at here sometimes is what I gather from this is that a lot of times our devastation, our wayward walk lies dormant at our base. It's in our foundation. It's in our fundamentals. And it doesn't appear that we have faltered anywhere. There's no visible identity to our failure, but it's present, it's lying dormant. But with the right conditions, with the right elements, it surfaces. And initially, it doesn't look real bad. It's just out of order. It's not the norm. But it's recognized as... You're wavering a little bit. It looks like you're uh, falling off the path. You need to straighten back up. But what the locusts do is their bottom ones are the bottom feeders. And as they begin to gain strength, now they start flying and they feed on the crops. So they raise from a lower position and now they begin to manifest or they begin to increase. The intensity rises. And then they begin to feed upon vegetation, crops, and trees, and the fruit. And as they gain more strength in their vegetation, now they move from crawling uh, and then uh, crawling up, elevating themselves, and now they move from a dirt level to a higher plane. And then they move from a higher plane until then they begin to fly. And now they become a swarm and they fill the air. And as they are filling the air, there are others that are uh, developing and they also are coming out of the soil and so what we see from this is is that the sin initially it doesn't really look bad initially the disobedience and the waywardness of ourselves right off of the bat is not detestful but it begins to manifest itself it begins to grow and it intensifies and then as it develops even more so the devastation it causes is even greater and these locusts they they were able to once the the plague of the locusts in 1874 and in 1931 in the U.S. of A. and across the plains of Canada. These locusts, when they developed this swarm, uh, it was referred to as like a cloud because their wings were kind of transparent and so with the sun glazing through the wings it looked like a big cloud was just swarming across the land and what we learn is is that these locusts they were able to eat the crops the trees the leaves leaves the grass they even ate the wool off of sheep the harnesses off of the horse, the paint off of wagons, the pick forks off of handles. They even would go into the homes and begin to feed off of the agrarian age then. The farmers, they would feed off of the food that they had in their homes and they would eat the carpet and their clothing. 
many people died not from being attacked by the locusts, but because they died from starvation. And what we gather here is, is that when disobedience lies dormant, but then with the right climate, and I shouldn't say the right climate, but with the wrong climate, the wrong elements, it grows, it manifests itself in such a form that it is totally disorderly. It's operating under its own governance, and it has no boundaries, just as the locusts, as they were feeding in the crops. They started off low. They worked themselves up until there were land mass. I mentioned 2 million square miles that corn fields and wheat fields were devastated and there were not even a twig left. And that is how sin, when it is without check, notice again how it's formulated. It doesn't actually, uh, the locusts don't actually uh, come into life until there is a drought. How does that, uh, uh, what does that say to us as humans, as people of God? When we go through dry spells, when we don't have the in in uh, the correlation and the connection with the word of God. What kills the locusts? Moisture, water. The word is our moisture and water. It is the substance of life, the Holy Spirit. And when we go through these dry spells where there is nothing there, our foundation is struck, which is where the seat of the locusts evolved from. So there are lessons learned in just the practice and what the locusts did and what they fed upon and how that the devastation just continued to grow. It increased the intensity of the destruction had no limits. And that is the same as when we allow the wrong elements to be our guide. It has no limits. Seeing the, the extent to the end of sin is death. And death was caused with the swarm of the locusts. Now, but the blessing of this in our lesson, the blessing of it is, is that God said he was going to restore it all. When we look over in receive, it says that the threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay for you the years the locusts have eaten. The great locusts and the young locusts and the other locusts and the locust swarm. My great army that I sent among you. Now in our lesson, don't have time to uh, go into it, but there wasn't it. Uh, it was alluding to the, the people were fearful of a marching army. And uh, there's commentary that speaks of maybe an invasion from the north and a Syrian army. But this was not the invasion that overtook the land. It was the God doesn't have to send a physical army to get our attention. Everything is under the command of God. But it says, but he's going to restore those things. And verse 26 says, 
you will have plenty to eat until you are full and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be ashamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be ashamed. We hope that something's been lifted, something was said, that gives light and understanding to our lesson for this Sunday, lesson number nine, Promises of Restoration and Gladness. As always, it is our prayer that we would not just be hearers of the Word of God, but doers as well. God bless you. And God keep you. Amen.